It's good to have Mark back with us, our leader. And Mark, we have missed you in great abundance. Proverbs 31, beginning in verse 1. The sayings of Lemuel, a king. An oracle his mother taught him. Uh, verse 2, we already start with a translation problem. Uh, I have a command. You have an interrogatory. You have what or why. Uh, I have, my translation reads, listen. Uh, we'll deal with that when we get to verse 2. Listen, my son. Listen, son of my womb. Listen, son of my vows. Three commands. Listen, listen, listen. Verse 3, do not give your strength to women and your power to those who destroy kings. Verse 4, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for rulers to crave intoxicants. Verse 5, otherwise, or you might have lest, he may drink and forget what he has decreed, and lest he change a verdict for every oppressed person. Verse 6, give intoxicants to the ones who are perishing. Very difficult verses, 6 and 7. They seem to be contradictory. That's my job to explain it to you and make it smooth. Give intoxicants to those who are perishing, wine to those who are bitter. Let them drink, verse 7, and forget their poverty and remember no more their misery. Verse 8, open your mouth for the mute to give judgments for everyone fading away. Verse 9, Open your mouth, judge righteously, and issue edicts for the poor and the needy. I must tell you before I begin, I'm a little disappointed that I'm not in the auditorium with all the fishes. I would feel so much more at home. That's much more my level, uh, the fishes and the ocean. Okay, here we are. Uh, we, started, uh, we started this superscription, which is 31.1. Last time we cut it short because I was long-winded. Uh, we will just briefly run over the things that I talked with. If you missed last time, and we will give uh, a full exposition of this Superscription, verse 1, the sayings of Lemuel, a king, an oracle. Uh, this is given to a king uh, by a very wise mother. And that's, in effect, what we have. Her teaching to him and the practical application. It's, uh, it's dealing with him in his character. That's the beginning and it affects his policy because she gives him wise counsel in how to rule. So we are in Father's Day with a message for mothers. If you're mothers, uh, if you're grandmothers, if you're aunts, this is very applicable to you. I hope you will absorb it, take notes. Admonition given to a king from a wise mother. Uh, Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 8 is such a parallel. Listen, my son, to your father's instruction. Do not let go your mother's teaching. That verb, to let go, deals with the hand. It's always in reference to the hand. Don't let go of the child's hand. Let's put that in practical context. Mothers, grandmothers, 
Do not teach your children the Word of God. Do not teach them the wisdom of this book. Here's what you're, in effect, doing. You're getting up out of your chair. You're getting in the car in the parking lot. And you're driving them down Central Expressway to downtown Dallas to the bus station. And you have the child in hand and you're walking across the linoleum floor and in the middle of the bus station, you let go and you leave them. That's what you've done. And you've left them to who? Who's in the bus station? Good people? Kind people? Friendly people? Wicked people? Scary people? Deviant people? And what? After so many years, you come back to get the child? Or perhaps sometime later, the ring of the doorbell, and there's your child. And you don't even recognize them. You've left them to be educated, to be trained up by the crowd at the bus station. That's what you're doing when you don't teach them this word. Never let go of the hand. That's this mother. She is all wise. And she is diligent about instructing her son. There is some surprises here. We stopped, really, with the word sayings last week. We've emphasized all the way through the book of Proverbs that it is oral. That there were no Bibles back in those days. So the families passed down orally this word, these Proverbs. This is Holy Scripture. What is written is what was said within the families. Every word God breathed using the personality of the individuals involved. This mother taught authoritatively. And she taught powerfully. We'll see that. What I want you to remember is that she taught as if she had the Bible in front of her and forcefully that this is the Word of God. Fully authoritative, adequate, equipped in every word for righteousness. I mentioned Karl Barth last time. I did so because he is so prevalent in our society today. He brought to us a new kind of liberalism. He came out of the darkest part of liberalism and had what the liberals would call a bright light. His books are that thick. Brilliant mind. Very little scripture. He redefines everything. He calls revelation an event. So if you participate in the event, then you're receiving the revelation. What's the event? The burning bush. Jesus speaking to a crowd of 5,000. That's an event. But to write about it, or to retell it, that's not an event. That's a witness to the event. So it's like a two-tiered system. What does that do? Well, what it does, practically speaking, is we come up with new phrases like, the Bible contains the Word of God. What does that mean? Contains. Well, it's there. But the witness to the revelation is not authoritative. That's what it does. Jesus taught just the opposite. 
He taught that the Scriptures were authoritative, and He taught them in many places. Let's just take one for example. When Mark gets to Luke 24, he will be full-throated with this. It's the travelers on the Emmaus Road. You remember? And they were discouraged men, downcast. This man they had all the hopes for. They thought he was the Messiah. And now he's been killed. And this traveler listens to this conversation. And he begins to instruct them. But how? With a powerful invective. How hard-hearted you are, he said, to believe the prophets. Where did they come from? That's Old Testament. Was it not necessary for Messiah to have suffered before entering into His glory, he asked? Then, beginning with Moses and all the way through the prophets, he expounded to them what? The Scriptures. The Scriptures. The Old Testament. And explain to them the things concerning Him. Now, wouldn't we all have loved to have been in that conversation? But what were the Scriptures to Him? Not a witness to the revelation. They were the revelation themselves. He called them the prophets. He called them the Scriptures. That's what we believe. A part of Bardianism that you hear is, uh, well, the Bible contains the Word of God, or you'll hear, do you take the Bible literally? Hi, I've heard this all the time. I decided, you know, I've heard this so many times, I am going to write up my own apagogic. That's my logical discourse with somebody that presents it to me. And so, I do. And I ask them, well, how do you interpret the Bible? Well, they want to know how I interpret it. Well, I interpret it by the genre that it's presented in. If it's a psalm, I interpret it as a psalm. If it's Narrative, I interpret it as narrative. If it's metaphor, then I understand the metaphor. Or I'm seeking to understand it. This term, literal, is a way to undress the inspiration and authority of the Bible. So I do this. I ask them. Well, let's just take Psalm 1, for example. And... He shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water. So, is it the man or is it the tree? Is it the tree or is it the man? How do you understand that? How do you understand the water? Is the water literal or is it metaphor? What about the roots of the tree? How do you understand them? What about the leaves? Believe me, they end the conversation rather quickly they realize they put their hand in the wrong hole. <laughs> Don't ever let anyone convince you that the Bible, from cover to cover, is not inspired and authoritative. Here is our word, kings. Now, we know that figure. Absolute power. We don't have kings here. And we only have a figure of a king in uh, England that we admire. But uh, it's absolute power over a land, a people, a nation. There's no parliament. There's no senate or congress to appeal to. There are no courts. He is the law. The king speaks. It's the law. This mother is going to have an effect upon a king. And that's interesting. His name is Lemuel. The name means dedicated to God. Here's what's fascinating. You go look at the kings in the Old Testament. There's no Lemuel. There's no Lemuel anywhere. What does that tell us? 
that this was a king outside of the confines of Israel. This is a mother that came to faith. Somehow, somewhat. And we want to ask all kinds of questions, don't we? When, when did she come to faith? How did she come to faith? When did she hear? Who told her? Was it a prophet that she heard? Was it a wise man she heard? Was she eight? Was she nine? Was she younger? Was she in her teen years? We don't know. But she came to faith. Proverbs 1.20 Wisdom shouted out at the streets. Could her family have been walking down those streets and heard the Word of God? We don't know. What we do know is if she became the mother of a king. You don't know what is going to be the end result of your children. But here's what you can do about it today. Teach them the Scriptures. Make sure that they know the Scriptures. Over and over. Think of that. Following the chain of wisdom from the words of God through the intermediary now to this young girl and she is a mother and here's her son, a king. Who knows the outcome of the providences of our God. Teaching, directing, she possesses the skill for living, and she is going to give this down to her son. It is not live and learn. It is learn, then live. That's what she is doing. Impressing the Word of God upon him so that he will possess the skills to handle life. Now, verse 2. I know you have interrogatories. I know you have what and why. The word is really in uncertain. The Greek translation of the Old Testament, called the LXX, translates it this way. What, my son, what Lemuel, my firstborn, and I say to you. Now, why don't we just accept that? Well, here's the answer, and I think it's a forceful one. Never in the book of Proverbs, from the beginning, now we're into chapter 31, not one time is the child asked what to say or how to say it. Not one time. That's why the questions, what and why, for a response, just don't fit the context of the book. Here's what you do have from the beginning all the way now to the end is you have the command. Take, hear, listen, heed. That's all the way through. You know where it's all the way through? The Old Testament. That's the way they were instructed. Israel's own epitaph. My son. That's what God called Israel my firstborn, Exodus 4, 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Pay attention to the epithet. And that is instructive, isn't it? Because she's outside of Israel. Why is that important? You read Karl Barth big, thick book, and he's got all these definitions, redefinitions, re-explanations. They're not biblical. They're thought-provoking, but they're not biblical. If you want to learn the Bible, you have to understand the culture in which the Bible was written. You have to understand the personalities. What I want to do is I want to understand the mind of 
the writer and the way he is conveying it to me because his understanding needs to be my understanding. So I enter into his culture. I need to understand what a kinsman redeemer is. I need to understand what the priesthood was, what the tabernacle was, etc. That's what she's doing. She's not prescribing a new order. She is going to the very epitaphs of Scripture and she's using those very terms to educate her son. Even though she grew up outside of Israel itself. This exhortation, my son, is more than a call. It emphasizes the close relationship between mother and son. It's the mother's call to the child that she carried and still cares for to this day. It is Hannah, if you will, bringing tiny Samuel to Eli the prophet. 1 Samuel 1.11 She gave him to the Lord in dedication. Son of my vow, my friends, your children are your legacy. That's what you're leaving in the earth. You and I are soon gone. We fly away. But they are here and they are your testimony. What type of testimony will they have? What will be your thumbprint upon them? Here, her teaching, notice, opens with caution. Verse 3. Kings are an absolute authority. They can rule in a reckless way. They can rule in a righteous way. How is that? Well, David describes it for us. 2 Samuel 23. Here's what he says. When one rules over a people in righteousness, when he rules in the fear of God, said David, he is like the light of a morning sunrise on a cloudless day. Like the brightness of a sun after a rain that feeds the grass on the earth. What's he talking about? He's talking about photosynthesis. That's what we call it. We brainstorm, it, it permeates the earth, the roots get moisture, and then the sun comes out and the photosynthesis hits those leaves and the plants and they sprout forth and they turn green and they grow. And David is saying, that's a righteous king. What it's a picture of. It's a picture of prosperity. It's a picture of growth. If you don't have a righteous king, you don't have that. You have recklessness, selfishness. Everything is for me. Righteousness disadvantages yourself to advantage others. Wickedness advantages self to disadvantage others. Do not hand over. Listen to her. Teaching forcefully here. What could destroy a dynasty? The last words in line two. Those who destroy kings. It's a mother's warning against unrestrained sexual gratification. You see, when you're the king, you're the law. You can do whatever you want. When you're a billionaire in America, you can do whatever you want. You can buy, you can sell, you can trade. It's all waiting for you. You have the money to afford it. You live like that, 
you'll die like that and you'll die unfulfilled, unproductive, and a cursed life. Look at this word strength. Here's where it's found. Hosea chapter 10 and verse 13. The King James has the best translation. It's talking about reliance. That would be the strength of the military, the fighting men of Israel. What Hosea says is that's a sin against the Lord. We are not to trust in the military. We are to trust in the Lord alone. That's frightening to me. Now, all of us have grown up post-World War II America, and we've all been told the same thing. We are the most powerful military force that the world has ever known. We have listened to it so many times, and we've grown accustomed to trusting it. That is not biblical. What's biblical is that the Lord is our strength. We, we trust Him alone. Look what this powerful military force that we're spoon-fed every day. What it, look at the effects that it brings upon us. We're, we're in fact a very fearful nation, aren't we? I mean, we're, we're afraid of inflation. We're, in, we're afraid of debt. We're afraid of China. We're now afraid more so of terrorism. We're afraid of Iran getting a nuclear weapon. But let me tell you what our nation is not afraid of. There is no fear of God in the land. Just last week, go to the White House, the emblem of our country and its leadership. And there were the homosexual flags hanging and draped all over it. There's no fear of God in the land. And the Bible says judgment for that is coming. Every day of the calendar, every tick of the clock, our refuse of evil is rising up to his nostrils and there will be an hour, a minute, a day, a time and when he has said enough. That is the fear of the Lord, my friends. Believers, follow it. Immorality. Here, women, She's telling him, they'll destroy you. They'll destroy your life. They'll destroy the kingdom. It did so after Solomon. Israel split into two kingdoms under Jeroboam and Rehoboam. This word, you may have ruin or destroy. The word is actually found in Numbers chapter 24 and verse 17. It refers to the crushing of the head. The crushing of the forehead, the brow. It's a knockout. Now, I've been knocked out. I was knocked out twice. And you may never have been knocked out, but here's what you do when you finally get a grip on the reality of your back. You say, what happened to me? That's being knocked out. And that's the destruction that's headed our way. It's what destroys kings and kingdoms. What happened? My friends, something I always quoted my children, to whom much is given, much is required. We are a people that have been unbelievably blessed to much is given, much is required.
verse 4. Look at this. Not for, not for. Teaching with invective. Drinking wine. The first warning was women. The second is wine. Drunkenness distorts justice. This is not a prohibition necessarily against drinking wine, but the prohibition, as we shall see, verse 5, is drinking to the point of inebriation. Line 2, for rulers to crave strong drink. Rulers, one in the same of a king. There is a certain dignity. There is certain weight to office. Wisdom teaches wine and women will destroy kings. Wine and women will destroy you, dad, you, grandfather. If it destroyed the greater, the king, you'll be swept away because you're far less than they are. This word crave is difficult to translate. Like so much of Proverbs 31. You may have to take. You may have desire. It's really uncertain. Uh, here is what you do when you have an uncertain word and it's forced. You go to the immediate context. Okay, what's the immediate context? There it is. Strong drink. And commentators have a plethora of explanations for what strong drink means. The wise man is careful regarding alcohol. I'll just leave it there. Be wise. People are watching. You have a testimony. Verse 5. Lest he drink and forget what he has decreed. Lest or otherwise. What's he doing? He's punctuating his argument. See, forget. Hey, we know that word. That's Proverbs 3.1. My son, do not forget your instruction. How do you make a point with your children? How do you make a point, grandmothers, with your grandchildren? By teaching. Teaching them. Last time we spoke about Paul and his method for teaching the Ephesian elders. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 31, he described it this way. I taught you night and day. With tears, he said. Over and over and over like a broken record. That's what he said. That's the way he taught them. Where is Ephesus anyway? Well, it's in Asia Minor. Yeah, right. And what's in Asia Minor? Uh, Turkey? Yeah, right. And uh, when Bill McRae came back, to teach us at Believer's Chapel after being in Canada for so many years. Remember, he had told us he had just gotten back from Turkey. And here's his observation. There was a mosque on every corner. And there's no influence of Christianity anywhere. The Ephesian church. Jesus Christ said to the Ephesian church in Revelation 2.5, Repent or I'll remove your lampstand. Lampstand is gone. It's gone. Which tells us something very important. Staying power. How do you have it? Here's how you have it by constantly repenting. That's what Jesus said. Repent or I'll remove your lampstand. So repent. Repent every day. That's what I do. I'm repenting all the time. 
And John tells me in 1 John, it's a proof that I'm a believer. Not a holy man. I'm constantly confessing my sins. I need my Savior not daily. How about hourly? How about by minute by minute? That's how I need my Savior. I'm, I'm a mess. That's my life. God loves me despite myself. Decree. That's law. That's uh, when David, uh, 1 Samuel 30, verse 25, when uh, he came back from a big victory over the Amalekites, he spontaneously, they had all this booty from winning the battle. And what did he do? He made a law and a decree regarding the splitting of the bounty. He made it instantly. Not anything planned or prepared. And here's what 1 Samuel 30, verse 25 says. David made a statute, an ordinance for Israel from that day to this. When a wise grandmother, mother speaks, it stays. It sticks. It lasts. Be ye wise. You know what's wrong with the land today? Our land? Those who make the decrees and the laws. Oh, they, they're good at writing them up. But they don't live under them. That's for you and me. That's for the commoners. That's for the riffraff. No, they don't live under the laws that they write. They live like they want to live. They don't pay their taxes. There's a system of justice for some and none for others. That's the rule of the land. Two-tiered system. It's wickedness. It's evil. And we should repent as a people, look at the way we're being governed. Proverbs 30, 28, what does it say regarding repentance? Well, here's what the proverb says. One who covers his sin shall not prosper, but the one who confesses and forsakes find mercy. That's what we need in this land today. Mercy. Mercy from God. Six and seven, now we're into policy. From the character of the Son to the policy. Let strong drink be given to the one who is perishing. Wine to those you may have distress, bitter, King James, heavy heart. The lexicon translates it bitter of soul, like depression or what happens to a person after deprivation. So, it's an emotional state. Two things here. First, verse 6 is a command. Second, verse 7 is the reason for the command. Let's take this verb to give. We have to understand it differently from the mother's strong command earlier. Verse 4, not for kings to drink wine, for rulers to crave strong drink. How do I know for sure that that's the right interpretation? Because it's completely out of the harmony that she had already just delivered to her son. And the Bible doesn't contradict itself. So we have to deal with this tension and we have to be able to explain it. That's my job. Verse 7 defines the people as grinding away in poverty. To drown them in strong drink is not wisdom. The absolute ignorance, ignorance of public policy that would say, well, we have all these drug addicts. Here's what we need to do. Give away needles. That's insanity. 
that's a country without direction or guidance and a thimble full of wisdom. One of the goals of the contribution of alcohol, Alcoholics Anonymous is the very first building block is to admit I've got a problem. If you don't get there, you don't get anywhere. It's a sin. It's a disease. It is a issue. And you've got to deal with it. Like a broken leg or a broken foot. You don't just leave it there and deny that it's not there. It has to be fixed. It has to be corrected. I happen to have a real problem. I'm a sinner. Hi, I'm Mike. I'm a sinner. Hi, I'm Mike. I'm whatever. Addicted to gambling. Addicted to drink. Addicted to this or that. Deal with it. Face your problems. That's the starting point. And now, once we have it, then you're on your way. Look at perishing and dying, often used of the devastating and destructive effects that God inflicts upon the wicked. Job 6, verse 18. Job says, caravans turn aside. It's a familiar verb that we've had in Proverbs. It's a warning by the parents to the young man, do not turn aside, do not go down the street of the adulteress, of the prostitute. Don't turn her way. I have a friend. I had a friend that got involved with a woman outside his marriage. He came and confessed to my friend. And my friend said, okay, what are you going to do about it? I'm going to break this off. Okay? When? Very soon. I'll call you, he said. He did call. He said, I'm going to meet her this morning. And my friend said very wisely, good, I'm going to go with you. No, no, he said, I can handle it. That's the last time that man was under my friend's ministry. He's gone. You can't handle it. You cannot handle it. That's the power of the flesh, my friends. We need the Spirit of God and we need to cling to Him just like Jacob did to his wrestling opponent and continue to say, we're not going to let you go till you bless us and give me strength over this. It's spiritual warfare. We're all in it. All of us. Job 6.18, caravans, here's your verb, turn aside to their roots. They go down into a wasteland and they perish. So line to bitter are the one and the same that are perishing. We're out of time. We'll start in verse 7 next time we're together. Would you please, please, We've got an election coming next year. National leaders, state leaders, local leaders. Will you please join with me in praying what the Proverbs teach? Righteousness exalts a nation. Sin is a reproach to this land. It will steal your freedom. It will steal your life. It will rob the vitality of a free people. That's what wickedness does. And it's a sin. And God and His heavy feet of judgment are on their way to us. That's the Scriptures. Let's pray. Thank You, Father, for your word this morning. Bless it to our hearts. Thank you for our fathers. 
but thank you for our mothers and our grandmothers and our teachers that are women that teach us and instruct us and are necessary for our children to follow the Word of God and to believe it and to live by it. That is the strength of a king. That is the power of a nation. And I ask this in the powerful name of Jesus our Savior.